One of your first decisions when you choose a vent mode is whether you choose a control mode or a support mode of ventilation. Um, for the control mode, what you're doing is setting a rate and volume or pressure that is to be delivered to the patient. Classically, this is called a continuous mandatory ventilation. Or CMV. And then you have to choose between either a volume control or a pressure control mode. And for the volume control mode, what you're doing is controlling the volume. So you set the volume that you want the ventilator to deliver to someone. And then your dependent variable is the pressure. Versus in a pressure control mode, you set the pressure that the ventilator is going to deliver and then your volume is your dependent variable. This you'll sometimes see called volume control or VC CMV because it's a continuous mandatory ventilation mode that is volume control and this is sometimes called a PC CMV for pressure control continuous mandatory ventilation. Just remember that these control modes of ventilation differ from support where the patient actually triggers the vent to assist them with delivering a set volume or pressure. So we'll show you over here, but pressure support ventilation would be a patient triggered breath that then is supported up to a certain amount of pressure. Let's look at some volume flow and pressure curves now. As I said, for volume control mode, you're setting a particular volume on your ventilator to be delivered. So you set this, and then um, over the period of time that the ventilator is programmed to deliver this volume, it will deliver this breath, hold that volume, and then allow an expiratory period. So this is the beginning of your inspiration, and then this is the beginning of your expiratory period. The flow of air delivered to this patient is constant over the time that the breath is delivered. And that should make sense because you have a linear increase in volume here, so you must have a constant flow for the duration of time of that inspiration. Once you're at the max volume that's delivered, the flow is zero because you have nothing moving in or out until you reach your expiration phase, and then you'll have flow or negative flow, so leaving the patient that eventually becomes zero again. So the positive flow is in to the patient and the negative flow is out of the patient. The resulting airway pressure looks something like this where you have an increase and you reach some peak pressure right at the end of when your flow stops or when you reach your maximum volume. And then during this inspiratory hold period the pressure plateaus a little bit lower than what your peak pressure was. And obviously as you exhale, then your pressure in your lungs will decrease to something that um, is allowed by the vent. So if you have no PEEP on here, your pressure will drop to zero at the end of this breath. Um, but let's say you have PEEP on, so the pressure is never allowed to drop right to zero. And we'll talk about PEEP later in this video because it's very important. You'll notice that this peak pressure occurs as you squeeze the last little bit of volume into the lungs and you have the last little bit of flow through the ventilator. And then um, your flow stops and you have the same set volume for this period of time, but the plateau pressures are lower than this peak pressure. And that's because your dynamic compliance is different than your static compliance or when you have airflow moving in or out of the lungs your compliance is different than when you have no airflow so this peak pressure that you reach is a measure of your dynamic compliance of the lungs which is lower than your static compliance when there's no airflow one other thing i can point out and is important to consider is the i to e ratio which is the inspiratory time to expiratory time ratio. Here, I guess I drew that another breath was sort of occurring here. 
Um, and this kind of looks like a, a one to one ratio of inspiratory time to expiratory time, which would actually be a relatively short expiratory time. Normally you should have more like a one to two ratio uh, where you spend twice as much time in the expiratory phase. So maybe I'll get rid of that and this should move over basically. So you'll start your next breath here so that you have a longer expiratory phase. And certainly it would be um, even more important to have a longer expiratory phase in someone with asthma or COPD where they have some type of obstructive issue and then they would um, take an even longer amount of time to breathe out this air. With a pressure control mode, you're setting your pressure. So let's say this is 20 centimeters of water and that is your set pressure. All throughout your inspiratory phase here, you, you're quickly brought up to this 20 centimeters of water of pressure. And then the ventilator holds you at that pressure for the entire inspiratory phase until it's released and the pressure will decrease during the expiratory period. The result is that you have this non-linear increase in volume of your lungs, which at some volume will stay the same because you no longer have flow. Then the pressure will release and your lung volumes will drop again. So you'll see airflow out of the patient. And if we want to give this patient PEEP as well, we could make it so that their end pressure does not go to zero but stays maybe at five centimeters of water or something like that. Here, the amount of volume that you actually get is entirely dependent on the compliance of the pulmonary system. So however much the lungs are willing to expand with this set pressure of 20 centimeters of water is what your final lung volume will be for this breath. One thing I want you to recognize is that during pressure control mode, the pressure applied by the ventilator is constant throughout the entire inspiratory period, which means that unlike your volume control mode where you have a peak pressure and a plateau pressure that are different because of the difference between your dynamic and your static compliance, here you just see a flat pressure curve throughout the entire inspiratory period. So don't go looking for uh, a peak and plateau pressure when you're on pressure control mode because it just won't happen but your peak inspiratory pressure during pressure control mode simply is whatever you have your pressure set to. Well, actually your, your set inspiratory pressure is only going to be equal to your peak pressure if you don't have any PEEP here. So we started from zero at the beginning of this breath and then our inspiratory pressure was 20. So our peak pressure is 20. We ended this breath and let's say we added five of PEEP between this breath and this breath. So now we have a starting pressure of five. So if we have that same inspiratory pressure of 20, our resulting peak pressure or total airway pressure during the inspiratory period will actually be 25 instead of 20. I'll throw some typical uh, vent settings that you may see being used for healthy people and then uh, you can adjust these as you see fit for uh, different reasons. So volumes about six to eight mils per kilo is uh, considered pretty standard and safe these days. Uh, many years ago, people were using much higher volumes for the ventilator and uh, this would cause obviously higher pressures to result and higher incidence of things like ventilator associated lung injuries and pneumothoraces or if you're using pressure control mode setting it to a pressure of about 15 centimeters of water is pretty safe and peep anywhere in the range of about five to eight is also pretty standard your normal i to e ratio as we talked about should be about one to two. And then for someone with COPD or some obstructive pathology, you may need an even longer expiratory time. And since I talked about it above here, I'll also just show you how pressure support modes work.
And again, this is where a patient maybe um, is initiating their own breaths. And then at some point, the ventilator will also assist that patient. So basically how this works is there, there can be various ways of the ventilator deciding when to support the patient's breath, but often it's a flow trigger. So let's say the patient has to reach this certain amount of positive flow in order for the ventilator to help them. So with a small little breath like this, they have not reached their flow trigger yet, so the vent isn't going to help. Then when this breath with sufficient force or flow happens, it reaches this flow trigger, and then the vent will initiate whatever amount of pressure support you've told it to. So here, let's give the example of 20 again. And because you've reached this flow trigger, this support mode is activated. So you'll have much higher flow because the pressure is assisting that patient with their breath. And eventually their flow will fall back down again. So your resulting volume then obviously with this added support will be much larger for that breath. Maybe this patient has a little bit of peep, so they've got positive airway pressure here, and then they take their breath in, slightly lowers the pressure. That makes this your inspiratory period, and then this the beginning of your expiratory period. This starts to get a bit complicated, but the ventilator also has to have some sort of logic that tells it when to switch from assisting the patient's breath to allowing an expiratory phase to happen. Um, so for some of them, this is a time-based event, and others have the ability to determine the duration of your supported breath entirely based on the flow uh, of the ventilator. So just like there's a flow trigger to start supporting your breath here, there will be a different flow trigger to stop supporting your breath, and you'll often be able to say, something like I want that to be 50% of what flow initially started my breath will be what ends it. So once the flow drops down to this point, that will signal the end of our supported inspiratory period. So obviously the pressure that's delivered by this ventilator will drop down to zero or whatever our PEEP is. and then it will wait for uh, you to reach another flow trigger with, a, with another breath for it to support. I just realized I should mention a vent mode that is commonly used and maybe otherwise confusing based on what we've talked about, um, and that is a mode that is essentially a pressure control mode. In fact, it is a pressure control mode, but it allows you to choose a volume to be delivered to the patient. So different manufacturers have different names for this, but the one I remember is pressure control volume guarantee, which I think does a good job of explaining what the mode is. So we can basically say that we want our volume to be 500 mils. Now clearly, if I just set my pressure at 20, there's no guarantees that I'm gonna get a 500 mil tidal volume. It might be much higher or lower than that, depending on what the lung compliance is. So what this mode does is it will deliver a couple breaths and determine what the compliance of the patient's lungs are, or how much volume you can get for any set pressure. Then after it figures out what pressure will give you a tidal volume of 500 mils, it will start delivering that pressure. This is nice because it allows you to use a pressure control mode if that's your preference, but also does the job of a vigilant anesthetist to keep track and make sure that you are actually getting reasonable tidal volumes. But then you still do have to make sure that your pressure doesn't get way out of control because of a, a low compliance situation. Uh, let's go through an example of what would happen if you had a sudden decrease in your compliance or you have lower compliance in your system than you expect. So let's say that you have a right uh, mainstem intubation, which is, by the way, the 
uh, more likely side to accidentally intubate because of the orientation of the right main stem bronchus. So now we have half the lung tissue to give a breath to than we were originally expecting. So the, the compliance of this system is essentially half of what it would be if you were giving air to both lungs. But any anything that decreases your lung compliance will cause these same vent changes. So if you're on volume control mode, then trying to deliver 500 mils of air to this one right lung is going to give you much higher pressures than you expected. And then if you're on a pressure control mode, let's say you're giving a sort of normal 15 centimeters of water to this right lung, you're going to notice that the amount of volumes you get from that are much lower than you're anticipating um, compared to if that same 15 centimeters of water was going to both of these lungs and inflating both of them. Then if you're on a pressure control volume guarantee mode, and so here you've set a volume of 500 mils, you're going to get high pressures. Just a note about positive pressure ventilation in general. It's an unnatural way of breathing compared to the negative intrathoracic pressure and gentle gradient that you get with a normal breath. This is often relatively high positive pressure. You get non-uniform alveolar recruitment. Not every alveolus has the same compliance and you'll invariably end up with some atelectasis or um, areas of collapsed alveoli that just don't open up as well with the pressures that you're using for your positive pressure ventilation. And then along with this, the shear stress or forces on the alveoli from um, opening and closing with the vent are pro-inflammatory and if you're on a ventilator for a long enough period of time, this is known to cause ventilator-associated lung injuries. The positive intrathoracic pressure you get from positive pressure ventilation will decrease your venous return for the period of time where you have the positive intrathoracic pressure. And along with this, you'll have increased pressure in the capillaries in your lungs, therefore higher pressure on your right heart or lower right ventricular output and uh, lower pulmonary blood flow which I'll show you uh, just a bit lower on here.